Welcome again to St. Mary Orthodox Church. We're here for uh, Christ in the Liturgy. This is class four. I'm going to hop right into it. All right. Da -da -da -da. There we go. Okay, so last time just to see a little bit of what we did. We talked about liturgy in the first three centuries. So we discussed how the theology of the church about the liturgy was centered around the Eucharist as the true body and blood of Christ offered in remembrance of his saving actions. It, during the second to third centuries, we saw an increasing transition from a service of an evening service or an evening meal surrounded in, in agape to the morning service on Sunday mornings, centered on the anaphora prayers, shifting from simple prayers and blessings and thanksgivings to a full-fledged epiclesis with added units. Epiclesis is the calling down of the Holy Spirit to bless the gifts. So a kiddush, yes, but kind of in a more advanced prayer of sanctification. Church order developed quite quickly with bishops, Presbyters or priests, deacons and others in well-defined roles. Eucharistic disciplines were present from an early time, including fasting, standing, the practice of closed communion, church unity, and of course, approaching with purity of heart, which we'll also look at a little bit today. And uh, we see practices such as a Sunday morning service becoming normative, the mingled cup using a cup of wine mixed with water. <clears throat> and also baptismal liturgies and memorial liturgies linked to the cemeteries and to the graves of martyrs and holy people and so forth. All right. So today we're going to look at liturgy then transitioning into the fourth century and onwards. And basically we're going to see how the rest of the liturgy comes into formation so that by the end of this class, hopefully you will kind of have a basic understanding of how the whole liturgy now, not just the anaphora, not just the core of it, but like the whole service actually came into being and, and how that makes sense. So uh, not standard form, standard form. Sorry about that. We see in the fourth century, the flowering of the divine liturgy into standard forms. Not that it wasn't present in, in forms previously, but it becomes standardized in the fourth century or begins to be standardized in different areas. Uh, it also becomes increasingly connected to the witness of theology. The fourth century is the time of the beginning of ecumenical councils and major doctrin doctrinal developments of, of expressing the faith in new ways against new uh, heresies and new challenges. And liturgy will be affected by that and be used in, in some senses by both sides uh, of, of different questions and controversies, not just... Um, there are many controversies, so many sides that develop over time. Uh, doctrine is influential on liturgical language. And we will also look at organic development of variations at what can be called, what has been called liturgical soft spots. I didn't come up with that uh, term, but I will use it from liturgical theologians as a, as a nice way of talking about it. Okay, last time we looked at like four different regions in which liturgical kind of generation was taking place, Rome, Jerusalem, Antioch, North Africa, uh, including Egypt, and then Carthage. So going to Egypt now, we're going to see some important influences coming through the church in Alexandria, which will be this, this kind of a major center of Christianity in the early fourth century and onward, but especially uh, with, it's the same, it's the place where St. Athanasius was bishop and so forth. So it's, it's a huge important influential area one of the early sources that for example we have is a is a book called the sacramentary of serapion the sacrament a sacramentary is what it sounds like it's a book of the sacraments it's a liturgy book it includes about 30 prayers it shows the influence of the didache and the apostolic constitutions that we looked at last time it has an early form a complete form of the sanctus prayer which is that prayer that remembers the angelic liturgy um, as seen in the prophecy of Isaiah that, that culminates in the holy, holy, holy Lord of Sabaoth. And it also has an interesting, uh, unique um, characteristic in that the epiclesis, 
is not a drawing down of the Holy Spirit to change the gifts, but actually an epiclesis of the word. Let your holy word come and change. So it's a little bit different. It's and uh, So it's a, a nice example of a variation that existed in one place at one time, but eventually was kind of uh, normalized to be an epiclesis of the Holy Spirit. Another example is the Strasbourg papyrus. Papyrus, papyri are those, uh, uh, you know, kind of specifically Egyptian style paper scrolls and so forth that that are very delicate. But uh, when we find them, they're always filled with very interesting things. This um, Strasbourg papyrus includes materials from the fourth, but also third century. Um, talks uses the phrases a reasonable sacrifice and bloodless worship, which will become normative language in the Orthodox liturgy. Uh, there's praises of the creator for what he had done for creating. Uh, and also a good example of a fully developed list of commemorations, which we'll see that as well. And this then culminates in Egypt in what becomes known as the Liturgy of St. Mark, which represents basically late 4th century Alexandrian rite. It's called the Liturgy of St. Mark, again, called that because St. Mark was the first bishop, essentially the apostle who ministered in Egypt and was martyred in Alexandria. So the church in Alexandria is from St. Mark's time. So it's the Liturgy of the Alexandrian Church called the Liturgy of St. Mark. It's not trying to say that St. Mark wrote all aspects of the liturgy at all times, but there are certainly aspects or elements in all of these liturgies that we see that go back to apostolic times, of course. It is still used uh, in the Coptic Church, where it is a regular part of their liturgical life, uh, because they're the Church of Egypt still. And uh, But it's also used in some Chalcedonian Orthodox churches, like the Rokor, who serve it on the Feast of St. Mark. And if I can find a setting for it that they use, I will most certainly try to do it the same here at St. Mary's at some point, because I love these services. There's so much kind of, it's like meeting your old cousins that you that you never met before. All right, another very important uh, piece of work is the Apostolic Constitutions I actually mentioned. We looked at the Apostolic Tradition of Hippolytus, the Didascalia, the teaching of the, of the Twelve Apostles, and then the Didache, which is also the teaching of the Apostles. The Apostolic Constitutions represents a combination of those materials plus something called the Canons of the Apostles. Uh, it's a later combination of all those works in a number of books. Uh, but what is interesting, um, it also reflects 4th century Antiochian usage instead of now we're changing and looking at Antioch and Syria. And it includes what's called the Liturgy of Twelve Apostles, and it is basically the first description of an entire liturgy in the, in the documentary evidence um, that we have. So uh, it's sometimes called the, the uh, Liturgy of the Apostolic Constitutions, Book 8. And we'll look at that just so you can see what that includes. For example, it has the divisions of Liturgy of Catechumens and Liturgy of the Eucharist that we, that we it doesn't use those terms, but basically it does kind of divide into that system. Uh, what I thought was very interesting is the readings are very comprehensive. You have not just an epistle and a gospel, but you'd also have a reading from the Torah, the law, and the prophets, and the book of Acts. So you get five different readings for every service. Uh, the litanies between the readings and the, and the uh, liturgy of the Eucharist that we now have about three to four different litanies that we will do and you recognize especially the liturgy, the litany of the catechumens, right? Because we have that whole catechumens to part or, you know, um, in Lent, we have the extended one in the pre-sanctified that says, you know, that those who are preparing for illumination draw near. They had a number of categories and a number of litanies in this, in this uh, liturgy, not only the catechumens and the illuminandi, which is a very interesting sounding word, but it's not the Illuminati, it's the Illuminandi, meaning those who are preparing for illumination. It also includes the Energumens, which means those who were possessed, because those who were possessed were also dismissed from the liturgy and were not permitted to receive communion because of the spiritual um, defilement in them. 
uh, because of that. And also public penitence. There were various categories of public penance in the ancient church. Uh, so, for, you know, at the time of the dismissals, those who were not um, permitted to communion for whatever reason, because of their penance, would also have to be dismissed at that time. So a very interesting, again, we usually assume that the liturgy started very, very simple and then became what it is today. But actually, it's more of a, a quick explosion to something quite complicated to an eventual editing down to something a little more simplified. The second part of the Liturgy of the Faithful, again, very similar to what we have today, uh, pretty much exactly what we have today in terms of its structure. There's a litany of peace with the kiss of peace and also the guarding of the doors, the doors, the doors. Uh, you'll notice now at St. Mary's, for example, when the deacon says the doors, the doors, he turns away from the royal doors, which are being opened at that moment, because that's not what that phrase is meant to reflect. That phrase is actually the front doors, the front doors, meaning close them up now. We're about to do the communion. We're about to do the Eucharistic prayers. This is holy. We want to make sure nobody's coming in who isn't part of the community. We don't want pagans wandering in, in the middle of the Eucharist. It's a holy thing. Uh, and that was a normal idea within within early Christianity. So this, the doors, the doors, and wisdom let us be attentive is to say, okay, clo close it up. Now we're getting into it, and uh, and so forth. Uh, followed after that was the transfer of the gifts to the bishop at the altar. You'll notice that that's a flipperoo in terms of the order of those things. Nowadays, we do the great entrance first. And then we do the doors, the doors and all that stuff. But actually, that was in this liturgy was flipped. Uh, there was the sursum corda. Sursum corda me is Latin for lift up our hearts and the sanctus again for the holy, holy, holy. So that whole sequence of prayers that go into the, the pre anaphora prayer, if you will, that leads to the anaphora prayer. Uh, this liturgy include the anaphora with the words of institution, the anamnesis, that is to say remembrance remembering all those things which, you know, the Lord has done, uh, an apoclesis, calling down the Holy Spirit, and then followed by a list of commemorations. So the whole anaphora really, as a comprehensive unit within the liturgy, begins with anamnesis and words of institution, climaxes with an epiclesis, but does not end there. It has to include the commemorations because it's about Everything in the, in the liturgy is like concentric rings. So the, 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 the epiclesis is the center moment there of the liturgy where the Holy Spirit is coming down. But those prayers that radiate from it are very, very important. So it's not just leading up and then boom. It's leading up and then coming back down through the commemorations. Uh, then there is the section after that where you prepare for Holy Communion. You have the holy things are for the holy the communion of the faithful, the singing of Psalm 33. You'll notice that we don't normally sing Psalm 33 in the liturgy, but it is in most of the liturgy books still, interestingly. Uh, and in some churches, they will sing it. That's the, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my mouth. I love when that is sung, and I wish uh, we'd sing that more often. But um, a lot of the prayers get kind of truncated down after time, and, and only maybe a verse is included, or the refrain was included, such as the Alleluia refrains. And then concluding the liturgy with a thanksgiving and a dismissal. So there's, again, those rings radiating outwards from the center. So this is, this is around 375 AD, but this is reflecting um, 4th century Antiochian usage. It's certainly not something they invented in 375 AD, but it was reflecting what they had been developed over the last you know, hundred some years, probably, uh, if not longer. Okay, so in the 4th century is a, again a really important time it's a church in transition you have the change of the church from being a persecuted kind of hunted community in the roman era under the emperors like diocletian and decius and, and so forth to under constantine becoming legalized and then under saint theodosius uh, one of his i guess it's his son or grandson uh, becoming the church of or the faith of the emperor and the and the empire essentially so it's a huge change that happens to the church there's a greater need therefore for catechism and catechesis you see the development of 
things like the catechetical orations of St. Cyril of Jerusalem, of St. Gregory of Nyssa, uh, uh, these kind of works which begin to explain what the liturgy is, explain what baptism is, more importantly, uh, for catechism purposes, uh, and a, a standardization is needed for this. Uh, there is the inclusion of the institution narrative, uh, which becomes increasingly standardized, but as we saw last time in the such as in the uh, anaphora of uh, the Kudusha of Adai and Mari from East Syria was not necessarily included in all of the liturgy, so it uh, becomes normative at this time. There's a more exalted tone. There's more veneration of the sacrament that takes place. Uh, you see uh, increasingly the, the awareness of liturgy as, as a sacred drama and what's called mysteriological piety. So, for example, you might hear people say stuff like the, the little entrance represents Jesus's coming into the world through his incarnation. So his birth and his revelation to the world as the word. And then the great entrance is his entrance into Jerusalem, where he will be sacrificed because the, the Eucharistic anaphora involves the remembrance of that. That, um, that idea of the liturgy as a, a sacred drama that's encompassing these uh, elements of the life of Christ or, or being an icon of the life of Christ are really don't get start getting articulated until the late fourth century and, and actually even later by many of that. And if we have time next week, uh, I'll try to show you how some of that developed as well because most of the time now that's how we like to explain it right we like to look at the symbolism of the liturgy as a whole and and so forth but the reality is that the liturgy kind of developed the way it did more out of practical purposes because there are certain things you had to do you had to have readings you had to follow the, the original worship of the apostles the synagogue worship and the, and so forth so it's just like it's like a natural progression that later gets this kind of what's called mis mysteriological um, interpretation. You begin to see the increase of the celebration of the liturgy. Uh, you have, for example, in the early sources, they talk about maybe Saturday night and Sunday morning. Um, <coughs> but eventually Saturday mornings become normal, Sunday mornings become normal, but also Wednesdays and Fridays become regular days of celebration of services in the church at this time, which is why, by the way, we have the pre-sanctified liturgy now still served on Wednesdays and Fridays of Great Lent. It's because Wednesdays and Fridays were days in which people expected to be able to go to communion. Uh, nowadays, of course, people don't think of that way. They think, well, I go once a week and that's, hey, it's good enough, Father. Uh, even so, even though there's increased number of services, you also, because of the the flood of people into the church who are just coming in because it's now the establishment church and it's kind of a, you know, more nominal membership. There's maybe less communicants. Uh, so the liturgy has a certain kind of cognitive dissonance with that. And that's something we're still grappling with, I would say, in the 21st century. And then, of course, we see the standardization of the anaphora and the liturgy as a whole in the Greek church. Like I said, in the, in the Eastern Syriac tradition, and in the Syrian tradition of the West and so forth, there's a lot more variety in the anaphoras that are used. But in the Greek speaking areas, it tends to be more uh, kind of, you know, drilled down into, into the standard forms that will become what we're familiar with today. And we're going to look at those as well. Okay. So what I'm going to show you today is that by the end of the fourth century, we have all of the elements of the divine liturgy as we would recognize it today, even though um, they're maybe not always in the exact same place or with the exact same significance. Uh, there will be additions, subtractions, edits, rearrangings that will take place at different times over the next thousand years. The, the liturgy is the form that we have. It is probably closer to the kind of a finalized form that comes out of the 12th and 13th centuries. But that's like still following a good, you know, 80% of, of the structure that was in the present in the fourth century. Uh, the differences are just like, again, where things were put, what order they might have been put in and so forth. Uh, so St. Basil and St. John, I think, even though, um, you know, the liturgy that we do that is in their names today, 
may not follow the exact order of how they did it, they would still recognize their redactions, their their anaphora, their words of their prayers that we use today. I think they would still be able to recognize it as their service. Okay, I mentioned St. Cyril of Jerusalem, for example. St. Cyril of Jerusalem is one of these catechists. He is a bishop in um, mid-4th century Jerusalem, and he's describing the baptismal service of, of the church in Jerusalem plus the sacraments, uh, including the liturgy. And so for like in our catechism class, we look a lot at what St. Cyril of Jerusalem said, for example, because what he was teaching in the fourth century about the Church of Jerusalem pretty much holds up today still in terms of how we do things in the Orthodox Church. Uh, his description of the service included all the things that we've come to expect. It includes, for example, the washing of hands, however, which we haven't really heard too much about. We've heard maybe here and there about washing. Um, but the idea that the celebrant would wash his hands before the beginning of the liturgy, that's, um, you know, that, that appears in the documentary record very strongly in, in St. Cyril as he explains it. Uh, today, that's a good example of something where some things are kept that way and sometimes they're changed. So if the bishop is serving, you will see the washing of hands basically um, during the right before the great entrance and the bishop and the subdeacon or the altar voice will come out and the bishop will wash his hands at the altar before he begins the anaphora part of the service. Uh, but for the priest nowadays, the priest generally is brought the, the water and the towel during the Lord's prayer litany. Um, I don't know how that practice changed like that, but that's kind of, what you see in the later books and and so forth it makes more sense to do it at, before everything but i guess it's the idea that it's right before we're going to actually touch the gifts and lift them up with our hands so i guess they figured that made more sense in any case uh, you can see the whole description there that's that map there is a picture of the holy sepulcher church and so forth so when you see the um the holy fire service that's this big uh, circular area here with the little chapel in the middle but the whole complex is quite large uh, and involves quite a bit going on there, uh, but again, it has all the has all the elements. He doesn't describe um, the words of institution being included. He just goes from sanctus to epiclesis. Again, maybe it was there, uh, uh, maybe it's not. He does talk about the words of institution elsewhere as an explanation. He does go through a long uh, uh, explanation of the Lord's Prayer in this, which is interesting because it's one of the earliest places if not the first place where we see the Lord's Prayer being included in the liturgy. Of course, the Lord's Prayer was used all the time for all sorts of things uh, in the church, but making it part of the divine liturgy is, is an example of something that comes into flowering in the fourth century. So the early Greek liturgies, I already mentioned St. Mark. Let's talk about St. James first. Uh, we did the liturgy of St. James here a couple times last year. It's absolutely beautiful. There are elements in there which are truly ancient. And, uh, but the, the modern form of the Liturgy of St. James has gone through all kinds of permutations in terms of what gets put where and so forth. The, the current version that we're using is from uh, the Russian Orthodox Church and uh, is, is well researched and, and based less on speculative reconstructions than it is an actual living transmission of the liturgy of St. James through the, through the uh, Church of Georgia and the Church of Jerusalem. So it's based on a living continuity, which I like. In any case, it is like the liturgy of St. Mark attributed to St. James, the brother of the Lord, first bishop of Jerusalem. Again, not because St. James wrote the entire thing, but because the core elements are from the Church of Jerusalem founded by or with the first bishop, James. It includes uh, elements of St. Cyril's description and also what will be called Egyptian basil. I'll explain Egyptian basil in a minute. It's considered the oldest form of the liturgy that is still celebrated. It includes the uh, offertory or cherubic, what would be what we would call a cherubic hymn, but it's it's the cherubic hymn is just a form of offertory. It is that hymn that we sing before the great entrance or during the great entrance, essentially which is normally um, uh, let us who mystically represent the cherubim. The, the one that's in this liturgy of St. James is actually the oldest version of that 
type of him, and that's let all mortal flesh keep silence. And so that comes, the first evidence we have of that is in 2 Sony 580. Absolutely beautiful hymn. And uh, one that's been, you know, kept by more than just the Orthodox too. There's lots of settings for it in the world today. Liturgy of St. Mark, as I mentioned, it includes parts of Serapion, Strasbourg, Papyrus, and so forth. It's used by the cops, sometimes uh, also called the Liturgy of St. Cyril of Alexandria. Uh, because of his modifications to it as one of the major figures of that church. But what becomes the dominant form in the Greek-speaking world will become the liturgies of St. Basil and John. And they're from, of course, from those by the ninth century, and it's starting to go into Slavic lands and, and other areas will become the, the normative forms that are in, inherited by the Slavs and the Romanians and uh, Albanians and so forth. So Basil, though he was from Cappadocia, he was in Egypt in the mid-4th century, and the first redaction of the liturgy that he did is called Egyptian Basil, or Egbas, in this, in this abbreviation. So Egyptian Basil is the kind of Basil's first run, and then later there's what's called Bizbas, which is the Byzantine Basil, which is kind of more developed from Egyptian Basil, and that becomes the dominant form. Uh, uh, for the Greek-speaking churches for many, many centuries. Only later does St. John Chrysostom replace St. Basil's liturgy. So now we still do St. Basil's on major feast days like Christmas, Theophany, Holy Saturday, um, but St. John's is like the normal one that we do most of the time. There are also different versions of Basil's liturgy that survive through Armenian Basil and Syrian Basil which also show their own developing strengths. These, of course, are compared to Chrysostom, CHR, St. John Chrysostom a little bit later, but not very by very much, just about 20 years later than St. Basil. He takes Byzantine Basil, combines it with that, that anaphora of the 12 apostles that was normative in Antioch. So that, that material that we looked at from the apostolic constitutions, that, the liturgy of the 12 apostles, so he, that's the Antiochian, right? And that's where he's coming from, basically. Uh, and he's so he's giving more of the Antiochian slant, slant on the on the Basil's liturgy. Uh, he worked on it in Constantinople when he was there, up until around 400 AD, or a little shortly thereafter. And if, as I said, it becomes eventually the typical liturgy that we do on most Sundays in the church and most weekday liturgies. Uh, but it wasn't originally the case. It's a shorter version. Basil. Basil is a shorter version of John, uh, James. And uh, so over time, this, this simpler or shorter version actually becomes the preferred, not, not the other way around. All right. This is uh, Father Alexander Schmemann of Blessed Memory. He was part of the liturgical theology movement and was very influential in this country, not just on Orthodox, but on many in reawakening this awareness of the liturgical tradition, its history, its significance, its meanings. And one of the one of the maxims that he brought forward was this idea of lex orandi, lex credendi. If you've taken my catechism, you've heard this. Uh, the rule of prayer is the rule of faith, and actually, lex vivendi is the rule of life. So, the rule of prayer is the rule of faith, is the rule of life. It's the understanding that what you pray should be what you believe. If what you're praying does not match the words of your doctrine, then you have a disconnect. And that's why in the Orthodox service, still to this day, you're getting all kinds of, of theological information from the services. Uh, that, that's not a coincidence. So we're going to look at a little bit of why that makes sense and how that works. But first, uh, let me stop and say, are there any questions up to this point? Well, I take a sip. I have, a, this is Elaine. I have a question about why we're not in communion any longer with the Coptics. So that has to do with the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD, a long time ago. And uh, in a nutshell, there was a, a, a difficulty between the language of na the word nature. And, and in a nutshell, the Greeks used the word nature to reflect the essence of God. So they would say that Christ has two natures, meaning he is both has this essence of a human and the essence of God. He has those two natures, fully divine, fully human, 
they would say this is the correct Christology. For those who were uh, of the of the of the non-Chalcedonian crowd, they did not like this language. They thought it was too divisive of of the person of Christ because they tended to think of the nature of Christ in terms of the substance or person, hypostasis. So to, and we do believe that Christ has one hypostasis, not a divine hypostasis and a human hypostasis. He has the hypostasis of the word of God. That's who he is. That's different than his usia or essence. So they disagreed on how you use that. They said, well, we like the language of one nature because we think of it as hypostasis, and we can't accept Chalcedon because it uses the phrase two natures. And uh, unfortunately, there were mitigating circumstances as always, the devil was hard at work, and that theological conflict was never able to be resolved, um, unfortunately. Um, and not long after that, in the early seventh century, you have um, something happens in, in the Arabian Peninsula, which will kind of mess things up for that region you know, until the present day, which is called the rise of Islam. So we have a good relationship with them. Uh, there are some theological problems because of this whole development with each other um, that make it difficult for us to be completely reconciled as, as churches, though there's been a lot of good work towards doing that in the last, I'd say, 50 years. And, you know, I pray that that could, that, that should be, that is a problem that should be resolved. I, I don't see any reason why we can't resolve it, but we'll, you know, it's not up to me. So uh, bishops have to solve those problems and they got a lot on their plate. So long story short. Okay. So in the scriptures, we see that the idea that um, worship and prayer should reflect theological teachings and truth are, are not unusual. We see it in the book of, or the letter to the Hebrews, right? By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, though it, though, and through it, he being dead still speaks. So Abel's sacrifice, it becomes this prototypal sacrifice, which still speaks to us. And the liturgy also has this quality to it as well, that the sacrifice of Christ in his, uh, in his acts continue to speak. Exodus 28, 11, of course, God commands us to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Why? Anamnesis, remember in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. And then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath. So, the services reflect the teaching of, of who God is, what he has done. That's another example. Deuteronomy 5.15, Sabbath also becomes an anamnesis or remembrance of the Passover. I use the term anamnesis more specifically as a technical term because the Greek understanding of this term is not just simply remembrance like, oh, yeah, I remember that happened. <laughs> it's, it's a remembrance that brings the past into the present. It has the quality of making it present in the now. So it's more than just like a memory, like a fading image that you grasp in your data bank. It is the, the living past in the living present. So, and I think that's, that's the meaning of these things. So for example, Deuteronomy 5, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and God brought you there. So therefore, keep the Sabbath day, keep the keep this Passover and keep it holy. You know, don't forget, live with this remembrance alive in you. And of course, the Lord himself commanded his disciples to do this in remembrance of him. Uh, not just like, uh, hey, remember when Jesus did that? But like this brings this to your present for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. You manifest the faith of the Lord's death and resurrection. Uh, early fathers talked about this idea um, immediately because it just was there. It made sense. So, for example, Irenaeus was dealing with the Gnostics. And the Gnostics 
again, looked at the body as something negative that needed to be escaped. Uh, the material world was a prison and so forth. They were drawing from usually platonic or neoplatonic ideas and not scriptural ideas, which, which view the creation as beautiful from God and the body as a temple of the living spirit. And so Irenaeus argues against the Gnostics by virtue of the Eucharist. He says the Eucharist establishes our opinion. Our opinion is in accordance with the Eucharist, and the Eucharist in turn establishes our opinion that Christ came in the flesh, right? How can you say that Christ did not come in the flesh when the central sacrament of the church is celebrating the body and blood of Christ? It's like <laughs> disconnect. And so uh, you see this is the kind of the, the challenges that are that are facing the early church. And St. John's epistles are already dealing with these. And that's why he says, you know, you know the Antichrist because he won't confess Christ came in the flesh. So immediately uh, in the early decades of the church, these were the issues. And for the first you know, century and a half, for sure. Uh, of course, it is complicated. For example, earliest forms of liturgy, as we see, were not super duper theological treatises, right? They were based on the forms of first century worship of the apostles. They had the mindset, they had the scriptural connection, they had the worldview, but they didn't have the articulation yet uh, that we'll see in later times. So the theology might have been there and they would have been able to say, yeah, that's right. Or yeah, that's that sounds right. But they hadn't yet like answered all those questions and hammered out all those details. So early heretical groups also used the same liturgical forms even when their theology would have disagreed with the worship. So how you baptized, for example, or how you did the Eucharist reflect, could reflect on your theology. And sometimes it didn't. Sometimes there was a disconnect because they were just doing the form without really, you know, having the full theology articulated yet. Uh, lack of precision in the liturgy could result in false teachings entering the fold and persisting even after councils. <clears throat> this is why the creed is later brought into the liturgy uh, as a part of the uh, part of the service, it wasn't originally obviously because the creed doesn't exist until the until the fourth century, and it doesn't really get added into the liturgy until even after that, um, because they realized you know some of these things are imprecise. Somebody could still hold a very heretical view saying the words, and that's why we see um, the liturgy of Basil, for example, really. Is, a, is just a confession of, of Trinitarian orthodoxy. It is really kind of in your face, clear about the understanding of who Jesus is, who the Holy Spirit is, and so forth, how he's consubstantial with the Father, all that stuff. So uh, because they realized they needed it. They needed to clarify because the earlier forms lacked the precision. Um, differences in liturgical practices could also, and were also, causes of later schisms. We usually think of the Great Schism as being caused by the Filioque Clause and the Creed, but just as important in the days of, uh, and, and of course, uh, you know, papal uh, jurisdiction over, over the entire church, universal jurisdiction was a problem. But another issue that really kind of irked people was the different types of bread. The fact that the, the West started to use the, the unrisen bread and the East was using risen bread, you know, so not the flat wafer, but the actual risen bread. That itself was jarring. There was a problem. It's like, well, why do you do that? Why aren't you doing it the way we do it? And what is that? You know, once you have this mysteriological piety, then you're adding, you know, Christ is risen. So why isn't your bread risen too? You get this kind of argument that happens. It was important back then. We don't realize how important it was, but it, it, it was very important. And it, and it would still be important today if, if we enter into those discussions. It would be, I think it would be a challenging situation. Uh, and here, of course, is our friend St. Nicholas, who came to give presents and punch heretics. But that's just a little fun there. Uh, one of our heroes, St. Vincent of Lorraine, you will have remembered him if you took the catechism course. A uh, very important figure. Uh, we just celebrated his, his feast day last week. He's 5th century, but he is establishing a very good um, argument 
for how we do things the way we do things, not just for doctrine, but also for liturgy. So, for example, moreover, in the Catholic Church itself, all possible care must be taken that we hold that faith which has been believed everywhere, always, and by all. Quad ubique, quad semper, quad ab omnibus, credetum est, you know, believed everywhere at all times and all places. Um, of course, that's optimistic, but in the, by the fifth century, you can kind of pull that off <laughs> because you've, you've, you've kind of, there's been, there's still all these doctrinal things going on, but, but, you know, you make the argument, is this the faith or is this a new idea? Because uh, they're dealing with new ideas all the time that are coming in. Uh, for liturgy, it's a good measure though, because we want to say, okay, is this an element that is that we can find pretty much everywhere? Is it share qualities that would fit into all those different regions, for example, at different times in, in centuries? Uh, then how do you accommodate then for any development? Because if you go down to like what was, if you can't actually find something that you could say is universally believed at all times and all places by all people, because you probably can't, right? There's enough variation that you wouldn't be able to find one thing that fits all. How do, you, how do you then explain development? And so he talks about the development of doctrine in, in these terms. The growth of religion in the soul must be analogous to the growth of the body, which though in process of years it is developed and attains its full size, yet remains still the same, the same organism. In like manner, it behooves Christian doctrine to follow the same laws of progress, so as to be consolidated by years, enlarged by time, refined by age, and yet withal to continue uncorrupt and unadulterated, complete and perfect in all the measurement of its parts. So take a child, when a baby is born, a baby is born with hair on the face. And if that baby is a boy, eventually, if that baby lives to adulthood, we'll get a beard. Those hairs will get thicker. That body frame will get more muscular and less wobbly. And uh, we'll be able to stand and run and do things, right? Or you know, be able to have children, male or female, coming together. So the liturgy is like that. The liturgy as a, in baby form have all, has all the elements, but you're, they're yet fully articulated, they're fully grown into what they will become as a mature expression. And sometimes they get a little bit old and uh, run down <laughs> and liturgies, maybe somebody comes along and says, okay, let's polish it up again and, and give it new life. And in many respects, I would say the 20th century was a flourishing of liturgical theology to do exactly that. Uh, Father Schmemann and people like him reawoke the consciousness of Orthodox people to the treasure that they had in front of them. Instead of looking at themselves as, you know, some fossil, they, they dusted off, polished off and said, wow, there's a real organism here. There's a living thing, living, breathing reality here. It doesn't become a, it doesn't mutate doesn't become something that it wasn't, but it it's, it's retains its original form. So then, how does development happen in the liturgy, or where, more importantly, does it happen? This is where we get the idea of soft spots. Soft spots are simply areas in, if you know that the core of the service is maintained the same from the beginning. For example, the, the, the bullet points here are, is the list from St. Justin Martyr's Ordo that we looked at like two weeks ago or whatever it was, uh, that maybe it was, maybe it was last time, but he, he talks about like six things that are done in the liturgy, readings, preaching, common prayers for all, kiss of peace, transfer of gifts, and the anaphora. Okay. So we know that's going to be in the liturgy in every liturgy in some way. How then does change happen? Change will happen at the soft spots, points of transition. So, how do you get to the readings point of the service? How do you even start church? Secondly, once you're done with the readings and all that stuff, how do you transition to the Eucharistic part, to the meal part, to the sacrificial part? That's a shift. And then lastly, okay, once you've done that and made the Holy Gifts, how do you transition to the giving the communion and finishing? So it's really kind of common sense. Oh, by the way, this is a nice icon of the angelic liturgy. The angels are serving the liturgy. Uh, this is really funny, too, because the angel is holding a fan, which includes an icon of the uh, cherubim, 
uh, or the six wing seraphim or what, ha what have you. And of course, um, we carry these to represent the angels. So the angel is holding an icon of the angel. <laughs> it's a great icon, actually. Uh, and of course, the incense represents the prayers of the saints and, uh, that the angels are carrying up to heaven. So it's kind of an interesting uh, meta type of idea. Okay, so how do you start church? You got to come to church. You got to get to church. There's a process involved in that. Even in the Old Testament, you see that there are ways in which people approached it. So um, Psalm 95 tells us how we should begin our worship. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. The psalms talking about the psalms. So psalmody and singing will be the main way in which we get there. That's how we worship. So singing is going to be the key style. Colossians, St. Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell richly in you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with grace in your hearts. So getting to the singing, that's going to be a big part of it. For example, Old Testament types that we have, uh, were one example is the Songs of Ascent. Psalms 120 to 134 traditionally were psalms sung by pilgrims as they ascended the 15 steps of the temple, for example, to come into the temple to pray. So the idea of a, a moving, transitioning song time of worship was part of the temple worship. Uh, also, from the early periods, we see how then the psalms get used by the church in our hymnography. For example, we love singing the polyleos, which you'll hear in church at times, especially during the mat service, but sometimes it might be used during the um, communion hymns or something like that. Uh, we'll have uh, Ascension next week, and if you come to the liturgy, you'll hear Psalm 47 being used. Throughout Pascha, you heard Psalm 68 being used, especially during, during Bright Week. You know, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let those who hate him flee from before his face, followed by Christ is risen. Uh, so these are, these are the, this was the standard way in which the church would, would pray, starting with Psalms and then adding in things like these refrains. Refrains were, you know, little troparia, could be the whole tropari of the feast, like Christ is risen from the dead is a whole tropar. Tropar just means like a trope or a type. So it's like the standard hymn for the feast. Another element that was influential was what are called stational liturgies or stational processions. In, uh, this is where you'll hear me laugh about Byzantines and their parades, but it's actually Romans in the parades. You know Romans love the parades, right? They loved all the, they had, the banners we have in church are basically like from the Roman legions. I mean, we don't use them except for when we go in procession around the church, but they, that's the type, you know. Uh, Romans love to go in processions, and Byzantines were Romans. So the idea that you would proceed to church and you would sing something along the way as you went from stop to stop was actually a regular practice in some of the large churches, such as in Rome and Constantinople. Of course, if you are not in Rome and Constantinople, you're just in the little, little dinky village town with your little village priest, you're maybe not going to make a giant procession. Maybe you might proceed through the village to church that morning, um, but eventually it gets simplified. So songs, psalms were sung with antiphonal hymns, alleluias. This was normal even in synagogue worship. They would go to the churches on their feast days, and they developed special hymns associated with the psalms, like we see over here in the hymns of Ascension and uh, Pascha. The refrains might be very simple, like, O Son of God, save us who sing to you, alleluia. And eventually this part of the service gets, gets kind of boiled down to what's called the anarchsis, which is the, I guess, the, the basically the entrance hymns. And uh, so a sequence of three antiphons followed by maybe like a little litany at each one. And that's basically what we have today. You see that. You see that we start the liturgy. Now we have the, the great litany or the litany of peace is the first thing that we do, but originally was not. That was originally done towards the great entrance, and it got moved to the beginning actually much later. So the original liturgy in 4th century, 5th century is starting with these stational liturgies, then 
you start with the three antiphons, the three little litanies, and then you go into the entrance of the gospel and so forth. And we see this by the uh, by the 600s, by the mid seventh century, in uh, descriptions of the liturgy of Saint Germanus of Constantinople. It becomes normative by the by the 600s. So the the little entrance, what we call the little entrance, it really isn't meant to be a little entrance. It's actually really quite a big deal. For example, it re reflects the actual entrance of the people into the church to begin the liturgy, and that's why if you see the bishop serving. The bishop starts outside the altar until the little entrance, and only at the little entrance does he actually go into the altar to begin the liturgy kind of properly. So it's a it's a it's a really actually a big deal, but it gets over time again truncated and seems smaller because we don't have a bishop serving with us every time. Uh, part of it might include well, what happens after is the Trisagion hymn. The Trisagion hymn is a processional hymn. It's meant to be, there's always some parading going on during the Trisagion. In our case, it's usually the priest is going to the high place behind the altar and the reader is going out the altar to the, to the place of reading. But there's movement happening because it's a processional hymn. Um, the bishop also uh, is doing a blessing if he's serving. So he's chanting from Psalm 80, Lord, Lord, look down from heaven and see this vine which thy known right hand has planted. And, and, you know, he blesses with that. And it becomes, again, this kind of antiphonal back and forth with the bishop. Uh, at the time, the, the, the reader then also gets the blessing from the bishop and goes out to begin the reading section of the service. So it's a lot going on in this little entrance. It's, it's quite involved. Uh, other variants include as many as have been baptized into Christ. That is because... On feast days where the Illuminandi, where the people preparing to be baptized, were getting baptized, they would get baptized before the service, and then they would also enter into the church during this processional. This was their processional to bring them into the church for their first liturgy as baptized Christians. And that's why we sing it still today on days that are traditionally meant for baptisms, like Holy Saturday, liturgies of Pascha, Pascha liturgies, um, we'll sing it on Pentecost. We'll sing it on um, Christmas and Theophany. Uh, for Feast of the Cross, before thy cross, we bow down and worship. Uh, and thy holy resurrection, we magnify. That is, again, remembering Psalm 95, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. Uh, and that's a later development, of course, as well, because the Feast of the Cross come later after the, after the time of Constantine. They're developing in the fourth century. So there's a lot going on in that. There's a lot of movable stuff happening. So it's a major soft spot, if you will. There's a lot of place for change and, and development. But as long as the stuff that needs to get done happens, you see a lot of different ways it can be done. And in fact, you can see a lot of different ways within a single parish. For example, if I'm the only one serving, the little entrance is super little. I walk with the gospel Around the altar, I come out the door, and I probably don't even go off the ambo. I just go in front of the royal doors, and then I go in. It's almost not an entrance at all. It's just like a, a rotation. Uh, if I have altar boys in service, then yes, we go out, and we go to the center of the church, and there's a big blessing, and they're standing in formation. And then if we have a bishop there, it's, it's the big deal. It's a big little entrance. And the great entrance, which we call the great entrance, really was quite a simple thing, uh, which has become bigger, but it was really just the whole point of it was, okay, now we're going to have the Eucharist, so you got to bring this stuff to the altar. That's it. That's all it is. So originally, the in the big churches, like in Constantinople and so forth, the gifts were not prepared in the altar. They were prepared in a side chapel or a side building even called a skevophylaxion, which was a place where they kept and stored all the stuff. In our church, we have like a side room on either side of the altar that serves that purpose. But basically, they would have they would have the gifts prepared and ready and brought into the church from there, and they'd have to go sometimes have to go outside and come back in again. So it was it got to be a kind of a big entrance, if you will. That's probably why they call it the great entrance. But it really had just a simple process of transferring the gifts. Today, uh, it could be that complicated. There are some places where you'll see 
uh, the table of oblation and the gifts in a separate space from the altar, such as like at St. Vladimir Seminary, there's like a, a side room on the chapel uh, that's not inside the altar. So they come out of the altar, they go to the side chapel, then they get the gifts and they come through the chapel and then go up into the altar. For us at St. Mary's, I have the table of oblation in the altar, as is the case with most churches. And we go, we bring it out in procession through the whole church, and then we bring it up again. It's kind of a weird thing that we do. And if it's just me serving on a weekday liturgy, I walk through the door, I go across the front, and I don't even go that far out. So it's, again, it becomes a very small entrance. Uh, again, you also had this accompanied by singing. For example, Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silent was the earliest version, then later the um, cherubic hymn. Cherubic hymn is from at least the time of Justinian, so 6th century. Before that, it might have been just uh, Let All Mortal Flesh. Uh, in the pre-sanctified, it's now the powers of heaven, for example, which is from the mid-6th century, um, and so forth. So these were hymns preparing the celebrants and the people for what was about to take place, right? We're about to go into the Eucharist, so lay aside all earthly cares. Put your mind into heavenly mode, because we're, we're going into the divine liturgy here. Uh, so that also makes sense. It's, it's a, a process. Okay. Uh, the kiss of peace, again, there's lots of evidence that the apostles taught this practice of kissing one another in church. I talked about this at women's Bible study. The kiss of peace was given in the church between not just the priests who were serving, but all the people that were present, except for the fact that you have to remember that women sat with women and men sat with men. So it wasn't a scandalous thing. You weren't reaching over and smooching somebody else's spouse. Um, you were with men with men and women with women. Um, again, it was a sign of the brotherhood. It was a sign of the purity of the community that they were able to kiss one another and not give a kiss as Judas did, right? But to kiss one another with true love and to be reconciled and to be at peace with each other. That's why we still say, do not come and approach the chalice if you have anger in your heart towards somebody. Uh, and of course, also the kiss of peace comes at the time with the closing of the doors because the only people who should be in the church there for that kiss and for that communion at that point were those who could take the communion, right? Nowadays, we are we don't close the doors and we don't dismiss the catechumens at every liturgy. We have done it at some times for those who, when we have a catechist available, but usually we don't do it. We didn't do it this year. Um, you know, we let people stay in the church and, and see what's happening, even if they're not taking communion, because we don't want it to be we, for educational purposes, pedagogical. Uh, but originally, that was not that was not okay, right? Those who were there should have been those who were taking Holy Communion. People didn't come to church not to take communion, which is a strange later development. The liturgy assumes that everybody present is going to be taking communion. All right, so the kiss of peace has a whole sequence. There's the litany of peace. The great, the, the great litany at the beginning of the divine liturgy was originally at this point because it's called the litany of peace. In peace, let us pray to the Lord for the peace of the world. Let us pray to the Lord, etc. It's it's all about establishing a sense of peace. Uh, then the priest blesses or the bishop blesses. Peace be unto all. Let us love one another that with one mind we may confess. We give the kiss of peace. That later the creed is added to this after 451, that Council of Chalcedon that we talked about. The Council of Chalcedon reaffirmed the, the, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, which is the one we read in church. Um, I, you know, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, etc. It was added into the liturgy, interestingly, by a non-Chalcedonian bishop, Peter the Fuller. Peter the Fuller was, uh, was a monophysite, or non-Chalcedonian at least, uh, who... But the one good thing about the monophysites was that they were really against Nestorianism. <laughs> so they were extra strong against Nestorianism. So, for example, uh, he introduced the reciting of the creed as a way to combat Nestorianism. And uh, so even though it was a non-Orthodox bishop who started it, it quickly caught on and became normative. Uh, it was um, introduced in Constantinople, like, what, 40, 35 years later by Patriarch Timothy. And it becomes inserted into the part, let us love one another uh, and let us, let us, uh, because, because in a way it's saying, uh, 
you know, we're kissing each other in peace, but let's make sure we all agree to the same thing. It's kind of saying it's a litmus test to say, okay, you say you, we love each other, but do you believe what we believe? It's, it's a chance to say, okay, if you don't believe this, don't, don't proceed. This is why we're here. This is what we believe. That's what, what we're doing. And it was really important to have that sense of continuity. And, and, I'll, and I'll say, I think I appreciate that because when I was first coming back to church, when I was in college and I was a first year graduate student, uh, and I thought maybe I'll, maybe I'll, maybe I'll try going to liturgy and I'll, maybe I'll try taking communion and I got myself ready. And when the creed came around, I realized that I didn't believe it. I was not, I couldn't commit to it. I was like, yeah, I don't know yet if I can only, if I can say one holy Catholic church, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's many churches. I, I wasn't ready to commit to that idea or that there's only one God, you know, I mean, I was like still kind of grappling with like, what if, I was a comparative religionist. So I was like, still had a lot of appreciation for other world religions at the time. And I still do. But I hadn't yet realized that you kind of have to make that commitment going forward. You know, you have to realize there's a truth claim that is on the line here. And so I stopped. And when that creed came around, I realized, yeah, I'm not, I'm not there yet. And it took me another few months as I processed that. So I really appreciate that that's actually in the liturgy because uh, it really does kind of say, okay, this is, are you sure what you're getting yourself into, right? Okay. Um, dogmaticon is a term for an image of dogma. So for example, if you look at that 12 apostles in Afra, it's, it's again, not very precise. It's just, you are holy, God, the father and giver of life. You are blessed together with your only begotten son and your living Holy Spirit. Okay. It's simple. It's Trinitarian, but it really doesn't kind of answer a whole lot of questions, right? So then you get like Chrysostom who gets into this, you know, very full theological explanation, you know, of, of God. And he's uncreated, he's ineffable, he's indescribable, but at the same time, he's eternally the same with his son and his Holy Spirit. It's like, now this is Athanasian orthodoxy. This is consubstantiality. You know, this is precise language. So you see that, that the development in the liturgy has a purpose and a meaning of why it's done that way. And Basil, like I said, Basil goes deep into it. And I'm just, you know, you've heard this during Glent, and uh, you can look at it in the slides later for yourself. So I'm not going to have us read it through tonight. Another soft spot on multiple meanings, the Virgin Mary. The Virgin Mary is, of course, a soft spot for the Christian community. Uh, Christians have been singing to the Mother of God for at least since the middle of the third century, because the one of the oldest hymns of the church is Beneath Thy Compassion, which is a hymn to the Virgin Mary, uh, which you see a, a Pyrus uh, remnant here that includes it from 250 AD. This is probably older than that. Remember that the church, the early anaphoras, included commemorations, that immediately after you had this drawing down of the Holy Spirit, you then also remembered everybody else who had also died in the faith. And they would include the holy patriarchs, right? Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Because why? Because God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living, right? And then they would say for the holy patriarchs, but also for the holy apostles and the holy martyrs. And as the, the idea of the communion of the saints develops, of course, recognition goes that, hey, you know, Virgin Mary should be included in this list. You know, it's kind of a big deal. So even though early commemorations don't name her by name, in time, of course, she becomes involved. Uh, it seems to me that there's clearly that she was being commemorated, though, through the liturgy at different times from a very early time because Syriac James, so Syriac James is fourth century before, before you have this division into Chalcedonia and non Chalcedonia. It's an important point, you know, because afterwards, non Chalcedonians aren't going to be as influenced, right, by. Chalcedonian Orthodox, which is us. So they have this petition in Syriac James. Again, let there be good remembrance of the mother of God, Mary, and of the saints of the faithful departed, my brethren. Let us beseech the Lord at all times. This is basically what a version of what we say 
remembering our most holy lady Theotokos and ever Virgin Mary and all the saints, let us offer ourselves and one another to Christ our God. That's, that's what's happening in that part of the liturgy. So that type of petition is very early in the liturgical life of the church. Of course, it's not until 431 that the term Theotokos is, is like, you know, officially affirmed. Uh, it's used before then, of course, but it becomes like it gets that stamp of approval for the whole church against Nestorius, who, who was teaching that, you know, the child that was in Mary was not was not God in the flesh. And that's why we have the term Theotokos. She gave birth to God in the flesh. Uh, Peter the Fuller introduced Theotokia or hymns to the Theotokos in his services to combat Nestorius. So again, an influence of him on the on the on the church. St. Cosmas, the hymnographer, who's up in our choir loft, uh, composed the more honorable than the cherubim hymn. The it is truly meet part, which now precedes it normally, was actually revealed by the Archangel Gabriel on, on Mount Athos in 980 to uh, some, of, some of the monks there. Uh, and all of creation, which we sing during St. Basil's liturgy, uh, all I could find was that it, it appears from the 14th century. So it may be older, it probably is older, but its use at that point in the liturgy is used at that point. So there's, that's a late development. So a lot of these things can, can come in at later times. And then the last soft spot that we'll look at is communion itself. How do you do communion, right? You, you've now blessed the bread and the, and, the, and the wine. It's now the body and blood of Christ. How do you get it to people? And that's, we still see differences. We, saw, we had to deal with how do you do it differently during COVID, right? And different parishes do different things. Well, you still hear standard communion hymns. Again, go back to the Psalms. Just like at the beginning, we start with the Psalms. At the end of the liturgy, we're ending with Psalms. Psalms, 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 all day long. You hear us uh, as we're preparing for communion, praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens. Uh, when uh, when the priest or deacon bring out the gifts, the choir sings, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And of course, at the end of the liturgy in Thanksgiving, we sing in some places, we sing, I bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall always be in my mouth. That was a communion hymn in, in the liturgy of St. Cyril of um, Jerusalem, I think. At the completion of the communion, the priest lifts up the gifts to the people and says, from the Psalms, the Lord save your people and bless your inheritance. Uh, as he's sensing the gifts and covering them to take them back from the altar to the, to the back to the table of oblation, where they'll be finally consumed. He, I quote the Psalms. And then uh, the choir then sings, let our mouths be filled with thy praise, O Lord, right? Let my mouth be filled with your praise and your glory all the day long. Uh, and we sing this. So again, beautiful, beautiful use of the Psalms through the beginning and the end of the service. All right, so conclusions for tonight. Uh, while theology has its roots in our rule of prayer, doctrinal reflection can and has reciprocated the rule of prayer by embellishing liturgy with greater depth. So they influence one another. It's not just, you know, what we pray is what we believe, but sometimes then what we believe influences how we pray. So they do go reciprocally. The liturgy um, developed organically to express theological truth in many ways, and most, of course, profoundly in the later anaphoras of Chrysostom and Basil, which is why they become their preferred forms. The introduction of various elements at transitional soft spots is the explanation of how the liturgy kind of creatively develops, but in a way that's logical and organic and still you know, reflects the theological understanding of the worship. And lastly, the hymnography of the church also develops along the same lines, increasingly reflecting doctrine, which becomes more pronounced with uh, than even the psalmody. The psalmody is there as the kind of the, the, the skeleton, but the muscle is that doctrine and those, those hymns of the church that get added to it. So the scripture becomes the bones the, the hymnography of the saints then becomes the elucidation, which fleshes it out quite kind of literally, if you will. All right. So that's it for her tonight's class. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it wasn't too, um, too um, academic. But uh, I, I just uh, when I did this class, one of the things I wanted to know is where did all this stuff come from? 
Why are you doing that stuff, Father David? Uh, and I wanted to be able to answer that for myself. And now for you. So I hope it was helpful and that you appreciate what you're seeing, you know, a living, breathing tradition, which resonates from the apostles, but is not limited to just the life of the apostles. It also includes the whole life of the Holy Spirit through the history of the church, which is an ongoing reality still today. So uh, Orthodox understand that, yes, the spirit is still speaking. It's just not speaking the way uh, many people think it is. It speaks through the liturgy. It speaks through the services. Uh, he speaks through the services to us still to this day and continually reveals more to us. And the more I study it, the more I see just amazing stuff hiding in plain sight. Every liturgy is a revelation for me, and I've been doing it for over 20 years. There's always something that I'm like, oh, yeah, that thing there that connects the dot to this, to that, to that, to that. And there's always just, you know, treasures old and new being brought forward from the liturgy. So any questions? I'll stop recording. Yes, I'll stop recording. Goodbye.